I was born in Oxford, Mississippi, and I grew up on a 100-acre cotton farm. Now, 100 acres is not a lot of cotton farm. So that means we, the family, we worked it. We chopped the cotton. We picked the cotton. We did everything to the cotton except make money from the cotton. But when I was a kid, that's what we did growing up. Now, while we were working the fields, we talked and uh, people told stories. My grandfather was a very widely known storyteller. He would hold court under the old oak tree and just talk for hours. And he was a good storyteller. Uh, he, he knew how to start a story and how to end it. He was very entertaining. And now, he was not a reader. I, he knew how to read, I suppose. I never saw him with a book, and I certainly never saw him with a pen. But uh, Grandpa Henry was quite the storyteller. Now, on the Tuttle side, and the Tuttles and the Adamses, all big talkers. On the other side of my family, the, the gardeners and the jeans, they were all very bookish, big readers, and I suppose I'm sort of the fusion of that. Uh, I remember I was a big reader when I was a kid. Books were my main pastime, and I gravitated towards fantasy and science fiction books because being a kid, spaceships and dinosaurs, that's what every kid loves. Somewhere along the line, and I wish I could tell you exactly when and where, but I can't. I was reading a book and I realized this might not be that hard to write. Now, I was wrong about that. It is hard. But at some point, I decided I was going to try it for myself. And uh, even as a kid, I would write little stories, most of which were just awful, and uh, which none of which, thankfully, have survived. <laughs> But uh, that's when I started. I actually started submitting to professional markets uh, in the 90s. Back when everything was done, either on a typewriter or on some very crude electronic word processors. At the time, I couldn't afford a computer system with the printer. Those were, that was like buying a car. But I did have a, a, one of the earliest Smith Corona dedicated word processors and I tore that machine up. It, you could store 50 pages on one disc the size of a notebook. It would clack out and print, because at the time that's the only way you submitted was on print. It would print one page per two minutes. One page at a time, didn't have an automatic feeder. So you had to print, put the new paper in, take the old one off, and I can remember printing out 300 page manuscripts that took an entire weekend of nothing but printing. Now, uh, sales were slow to come at first. And my first professional sale, though, was to Marion Zimmer Bradley's Fantasy Magazine. Of course, she has since passed and the magazine is gone. But that was a professional sale because I made, if I remember correctly, $350 from that sale. And at that time, that was a huge success. Better than that though, Vincent DeFate, who's a very well-known artist, he illustrated the story. So my first published story, I had a famous artist illustrate it. I still have uh, several of the prints. In fact, Vincent DeFate himself sent me a proof of the main illustration for the story, which I still have. At that point, I knew that I was gonna keep writing, despite the fact that it's lonely, it can be grueling. Uh, sometimes you just don't feel like doing it, but you have to keep doing it. Now, Harlan Ellison is famous for saying, if you can quit, quit, because you're probably not a writer. But I can't seem to quit. So I'm already seven books into one series, working on the eight. I've got a young adult series that I'm halfway through the second book. So I, I'm not going to quit writing. Uh, while I'm doing it, it, it's hard work. I mean, it's really hard work, uh, especially since I still have my day job. I still go to work every day, come home, we've got dogs to deal with, we've got the usual chores and whatnot. And then you have to go sit at a keyboard and try to be brilliant. Because unless you're being brilliant, there's no market for it. So that's, that's the battle I think every writer faces. You've got to weigh your writing time along with all the other demands. You've got to portion out your energy too. I mean, it's very hard to, 
to go work hard all day and then come home and write convincingly. So that's something we all face though. But when it works and things are going well, it is a lot of fun. My second professional sale was to Weird Tales. Now I'm sure everyone's heard of Weird Tales magazine. They've been around since the 30s. And uh, when I hit Weird Tales, that was a major milestone. Now, that story, of course, it was a fantasy. Some people would call it a horror story. I maintain it's just a dark fantasy. It was set in an alternate uh, Civil War. And I knew nothing about the Civil War more than, you know, basic high school. And uh, I just made things up on the fly. I put them in the story, mailed it off. Well, I didn't realize what sticklers they were for detail. So they, before they decided to buy my story, they sat down with maps and history books and picked it apart to see if I was being accurate. And uh, it turns out I was, but that was sheer blind luck because I did none of that when I wrote the story. And that taught me a very valuable lesson. If you're going to address historical topics or settings, you better know what you're talking about because you only get that lucky once. <laughs> and I've used my time. Now, publishing has changed a lot. Even in the 90s, there were a huge number of markets for print magazines. But one by one, most of those faded away until there just weren't any. Now, the rise of the ebook was actually a good thing for me because I have managed to find publishers who are willing to embrace the ebook trend and go both ways. I've got print books and ebooks. And that's worked really well, even though the ebook sales are probably 100 to 1 of all the print editions. Some of my earliest influences, uh, Roger Zelazny, one of my absolute all-time favorite authors. When I read his Amber series, I knew at that moment I did want to write fantasy because he was brilliant at it. I don't know that anybody has done it better since then. I love those books. And so they've been a big influence. And what they taught me about fantasy was this, you make it your own. While everybody else was writing about dragons and elves and trying to copy Tolkien, Zelazny went in and just created his own entire universes, more than one of them. And he did it so brilliantly, it eclipsed everything else as far as I was concerned. So what he taught me was that you make your own rules. If you don't want to write about elves and dragons, don't. Come up with something better, which is what he did, and which is what I've tried to do. What I like about fantasy as a genre is that adaptability. I can create any world I choose to, fill it with anybody I want to, and let the story go from there. I'm not stuck in Mississippi or 2013. I can tell the stories I want to tell. Now, as a Southern author, there's a certain expectation, and there's always been this, that I will write about pickups, catfish, drunk people, and family feuds. Now, I write about most of these things except the pickups, but I do it in my own settings. Um, you, I think if you'll read my works, you'll find there's some really strong Southern flavors to it. I do the same things that a lot of the traditional Southern authors have done. I just do them in new settings. Now, another author I really love is Terry Pratchett, his Discworld series. There is nothing funnier. Those books are the funniest books ever written, the whole series is. But what I learned from him was this. The best comedy is tragic. I mean, there's always something sad at the center of it and it really gives it depth. And that's what I've tried to do. You'll find very little slapstick style humor in my books. These are damaged people going through life as best they can. And when they do see something funny, I, th I think it's genuinely funny. It's kind of humor born of pain. So I do put a lot of humor in my books and I put a lot of people I've known. Uh, Mama Hogg, uh, probably the favorite recurring character in the Marquette series is based on my father's mother, my grandmother, and that's how she talked. And she was kind of a short, squat, wild-haired woman who brewed things in a big iron pot and was very plain spoken. So they're based on real people, a lot of them. Now Marquette, people ask me, who is he based on? He is who I wish I could be. He always has 
that snappy retort no matter the situation. He generally doesn't know what to do next, but he sort of manages to wing it and uh, come out on top. I've always had a day job. Uh, that's one thing that a lot of writers have. If you don't instantly find huge success, you're going to work. And uh, I've got a job at the University of Mississippi with computers. Uh, I like it. You know, it, it's, it's a good job for a writer to have. And I work with big machines, big servers, lots of them. And I've been there for quite a long time. I started in 1982. I worked uh, about 10 straight years on the graveyard shift, and that gave me a lot of time to write. Uh, didn't sell anything from that period, but I think I worked my way through that mythical million bad words every writer has to get out of them on the graveyard shift. So when I finally got off of it, I started turning out stories that actually sold. But let's talk about rejection for a moment, because that's something every writer has to go through. Now. At first, I got a lot of rejections from editors who were very helpful. Whatever success I have today, I owe it to the people who took the time, even though they weren't buying the piece, to tell me what I had done wrong. And uh, now I was one of the lucky ones. I was young and inexperienced, but I knew enough to listen to them. I didn't get mad. I didn't decide to give up. I didn't fire off angry letters to them telling them what an idiot they were for not buying it. I tried to fix it. And so there were several editors, chief among them, Mary and Zimmer Bradley, who rejected three or four of my pieces with fairly detailed reasons why she wouldn't do it and some encouragement. Somebody needs to tell you when you're not writing the right things in the right way. Now, after Mary and Zimmer Bradley bought my first story, uh, well, she passed away soon after that one, but I don't know that I've been actually rejected since then. I've managed to sell just about everything I've submitted, which is pretty unusual. But it's a trend that I hope continues. The Marquette series, of course, is my most popular series. It's now seven books strong, and I'm working on the eighth book. Now, I sold the first book, I believe it was in 2008, and it came out in 2009, I believe that's correct. And uh, it's just progressed. I've been able to maintain the characters and the momentum of the series. They're all put out by, it's spelled Sam Hain, it's pronounced so in publishing. They do some horror, some paranormal romance. They've been great to work with. They've really taken an interest in the series and I've loved working with all their editors and all their other staffers. It, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I've got a young adult series, uh, All the Paths of Shadow is the first novel in that series. There's also a standalone novella with the same characters called Saving the Sammy. And at some point the second book in that series will come out. And I've also got a variety of short stories and anthologies. Uh, the Wistrel Complete is all the Wistrel the Wizard stories. Malara and Burn on the Road, that's all the Malara and Burn stories. These are all fantasy stories. Then I've got an anthology called The Far Corners, which is just a series of unconnected stories featuring other characters. I've also got uh, uh, The New Author's Guide to Writing, which is a sort of a how-to, tells you how to avoid some of the mistakes I made early on, what editors are looking for, how to format it, that sort of thing. And uh, Passing the Narrows, which is the weird tale story, the rights have perverted to me. So I put that out as an ebook. So all of that's available. You can look on my website, you can go to Amazon, it's all out there. Now, the future, I'm gonna continue the Marquette series, of course. I'm already on the next book and I already have the next one sort of loosely plotted out. So that series, I will write those as long as they'll buy them because I really enjoy those and they've been pretty popular. But writing is not all work and drudgery. There are some perks to being a writer. Book signings, for instance. Uh, you get to go to a bookstore. They generally serve snacks. You sit behind a little desk. People come up, talk to you. You sign their books. They go their happy way. Now, that's a lot of fun, and it's validation. Uh, since I'm a fantasy author, one of the best venues I have to engage with the fans are conventions 
Mid-South Con, Memphis, Tennessee. Love to go there. That's always a lot of fun. And I've been lucky. I've won numerous Daryl Awards. Now, the Daryl Awards are awarded from the Mid-South Con, and I've won that several times for several different titles, and that's, that's always rewarding. I know that those readers, who the jury who selects the Daryl Awards material, they're dedicated readers. They're people of taste. They know something good when they see it and when they read it. So to be awarded a Daryl Award, that's, that's a serious, serious thing. That's been one of the things that let me know that my writing was actually good, aside from sales or anything else. To have the Daryl Awards jury say, yes, this is worthy an award, that's, that's a big deal. When I'm not writing, uh, I still like to do, I've got some art that I've made. Some of it's based on items from my stories. That's a lot of fun just to sort of make the props that I imagined. Uh, they're generally woodworking, that sort of thing. I've made some steampunk pistols and some other odds and ends. Uh, anything I could do with my hands that involves power tools, carving, blow torches, anything like that. It, it's all fun. Sometimes writing is a very, you know, it's a mental cerebral process. And sometimes I just want to sit down with a, a tool and make something. But even that winds up usually having a fantasy bent to it. Writing. You either do it or you don't. I know a lot of people say, I'm going to write a book one day, I'm going to do this, I want to do this. Well, it's a lot of hard work and unless somebody has a gun to your head, you have to be able to say, I have to write. It has to be almost a compulsion to the point that if you don't write for several days, you feel a pressure almost building up inside you. So in that respect, yes, I, I have to write. My, my grandfather had the opportunity to just sit under a tree and talk, and maybe he had to do that too, I don't know. I've got my own tree, which is a word processor that I just have to put the words into. Now, I've been lucky in that people will buy them and pay me for them, uh, but even if they weren't, I would probably still have to do it.